Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for listening, guys. We are back at it after spring practice was delayed for a week, thanks to spring break for SMU. Uh, some of the coaching staff and players were able to get out, kind of enjoy a little bit after completing five practices for spring break. They come back now, and we're back on the practice field on Tuesday. We had a lot to get to. Obviously, we'll talk about some Pac-12 realignment talk later on in the podcast, but I do want to kind of give you the rundown about what to know now that SMU's back at spring football practice. Let's lead off with a couple of key questions. Where were the suspended players? Well, they were still suspended. Running back Kamar Wheaton, wide receiver Teddy Knox, and defensive end Jalen Samuels, all not at practice. Kiki Burns, uh, and Sam Westfall were two new absences, but probably um, not necessarily, suspended, although we have not talked to Rhett Lashley. Um, but those were two key guys that weren't out there for the Mustangs now that spring break is back uh, or spring break is over and they are now back. So those were two noticeable guys that were with the team um, and on the practice field leading into uh, spring break. So those are the two new guys that weren't at practice. Again, they we don't necessarily know if they were suspended. Uh, they could have had class. They could be hurt. It could be a multitude of things. We'll try to get uh, some insider knowledge for you guys at on the Pony Express on that. But as of the time of this recording, didn't get a clear answer on what's up with those guys just yet. And it was kind of rainy. It's kind of ugly in Dallas uh, while SMU was practicing and the defense won the day. Um, this is a day that uh, they were able to get a put up front, slick on the grass. Defensive linemen couldn't necessarily plant as well as they usually do in pass pro. Uh, and they got after Preston Stone, Kevin Jennings, and Alex Padilla, who are the quarterbacks, obviously throwing it around at practice today. And I think the biggest takeaway take is how impressive this defensive line for SMU has been. And I, and I look at what they're able to do up front, and it's clear to me that you, know, you look at what Calvin Thibodeau has assembled with these Miami defensive line transfers, uh, Elijah Roberts and Jordan Miller. Uh, of course, Jordan Miller there, number six in the drill, if you're watching on our YouTube channel uh, coming up here in a second. Uh, he's just a massive man that moves a pocket. But I also got to give a little bit of credit to Braden Flowers, who I mentioned that slick field. Well, uh, he was able to make P.J. Williams, the highly touted transfer from Texas A&M, completely whiffed, kind of, you know, a little bit of a um, – bit of the, the grass being a, a factor there, but he showed some quickness. This defensive line has been impressive. They've been com competitive. You look at Elijah Chapman coming back and Devere Levelson coming back, and then you factor in uh, that they do have guys uh, like Elijah Roberts, Jordan Miller, Braden Flowers. You see Dylan Frazier, the uh, redshirt freshman, working out in a drill there. Um, they've added some size, and it just looks completely different. Um, between the two, um, you know, just just between last year's version of the defensive line and, and this year's. And last year's had Terrence Newman, you know, kind of a fire hydrant big guy in the middle. But adding Jordan Miller and Elijah Roberts with that length has just been a game changer. And they've been able to get pressure for the most part on Preston Stone, Kevin Jennings and those guys. And we saw that today. I think the defense won the first practice back after spring break and um, as we you know, continue to roll some video here uh, from practice on, on our YouTube channel for those watching, uh, this is a practice that was a little bit sloppy on the offensive side of things. Some ball handling issues between quarterback and centers. Uh, obviously, at the end of that play, you saw Jalen Knighton um, you know, kind of fumble it. I don't know if it would have been whistled or would have been dead or whatever uh, in a game. But uh, you know, Preston Stone was under duress. Kevin Jennings was under duress. Um, and we'll see Ahmad Moses make a big play at the end of this video. Uh, I got to give credit to Ahmad. Here's a guy that you saw Jonathan McGill come in. You saw CJ Sanders come into the safety room. You had Brian Massey back. You had Brandon Crosley back. Isaiah Wachobia, this was his first practice, not in red in quite some time. Well, he just continues to keep making plays. And I think you'll see it here at the end um, after this run by LJ Johnson, who had a great practice. Uh he just was able to make plays. He gets an interception here to cap the team period. Um, just read it really well down the seam there. Makes a play down the middle of the field. He is really staking a claim. And we talked about him at OnThePonyExpress.com for our subscribers who jumped on board. 
he was somebody that wasn't going to give up. He wasn't going to go away in the competition, the safety room, and he was going to find a way to see the field. Obviously, we're still a long way away from game one against uh, Louisiana Tech, but he is not letting up. He's battling uh, Brian Massey at the safety position, who's also had a good spring. This secondary and uh, Rob Likens, the wide receivers coach, you'll hear more from him later on in the podcast. Rob Likens talked about it as well. Uh, just the way they were able to um, add depth and not have a drop off uh, when it came to uh, that overall group in the secondary has just added to the competition level between the wide receivers and the corners and the safeties, everybody involved in the secondary and passing game overall. So you've got to give credit to the coaching staff for addressing the position, but don't, don't get it twisted. Ahmad Moses is certainly making his claim that he needs to be a starter and there's some merit to that. So uh, CJ Sanders had a couple good pops uh, during the team period and seven on seven on some key players. I think he's somebody who's, you know, continuing to battle Brandon Crosley. I think the biggest thing with the safety group, watching them, they bring the blitz from different areas. They're all interchangeable now. I think last year they were kind of all in their spots and all very much in certain silos. Now Scott Simons, who's taken over the safety room with Kyle Cooper, they've wanted to fix this position, you know, themselves in terms of Scott Simons being the defensive coordinator. Now they have guys that they can just rotate at different spots. And we were kind of talking about this today as uh, the media, and it just makes a lot of sense for them to kind of roll some of these guys and, you know, when one needs a break, you take them out and you plug in so-and-so. And they are so interchangeable. That's been the big change we've seen as the defense has tried to defend the SMU offense in practice. So I'm really starting to get high on this safety group. I think the corner group has shown a good bit. Um, Jahari Rogers hasn't been in practice in terms of uh, being able to practice. He's been hurt. Um, uh, Bryce McMorris is still coming off. He's been with the safety group, but he's been coming off that ACL. So he's still recovering. Uh, I mentioned Sam Westfall not there today. They have some guys that are making, you know, plays. Charles Woods, uh, Kavaris Hall seen a lot of time. Um, you know, Chris Meganson, A.J. Davis at the corner spot. But that group is still sorting itself out. They're improved from a depth and a competition standpoint and a talent standpoint overall. But I think the clear-cut winner between the two positions so far is that safety room between Jonathan McGill's leadership, Brandon Crosley continuing to build off of the season he had, Brian Massey trying to balance back, Ahmad Moses trying to stake his claim, um, CJ Sanders getting into the mix, Isaiah Wachovia continuing to come along. You know, now he's somebody that maybe you have to start talking about uh, in that safety room. He almost had an interception uh, at practice today. Now that safety room looks like it should um, in terms of at least on paper. And now they're starting to put it together in practice. So, very impressive group um, from SMU. I think the big question this is starting to lead into, and I'll play a clip for you guys from Johnny Burr, the SMU quarterbacks coach, uh, who met with us uh, after practice. I'm not ready to go there because this is a practice that was rainy, it was ugly, but obviously you've still got to be able to produce in this weather and all those things. But you can tell that I think the one thing on SMU's coaching staff's minds, if they have questions about Preston Stone or even Kevin Henry Jennings, is they haven't really been through failure. They haven't uh, been in enough game action to know some of the things that Tanner Mordecai knew from his experience both at Oklahoma and at SMU. Here's what Johnny Brewer said when he was asked about Preston Stone and then also kind of the difference now with that relatively uh, inexperienced quarterback room he's got in 2023. Uh, Preston's doing a good, good job of, uh, you know, the first time taking it over as his team. Um, you know, he's coming out here and he's got high energy, uh, which he had before, but when you're the guy and everybody's looking at you, like now they're, you're holding you accountable. Like, what are you doing every day? How are you working? How are you working out? You know, where are the accountabilities, that kind of deal? And so he brings some, some energy, some juice to the offense, and uh, uh, he is um, he's learning how to grasp with – not always throwing the best ball or not always making the best read, like how to just forget and move on, forget and move on. And that, that's been the biggest thing I've seen this spring the first through the first, what, six days, you know, is like his ability to, okay, hey, threw a ball, bad ball, great. Or I threw a great ball, good. Like just keep playing, keep playing. That's kind of been our focus throughout this spring with him. 
when you talk about it being his team a year ago at this time, you had a guy in that role who was coming up on a fifth year. Yeah. How does that make it different for you and the coaching staff to have a much younger guy in that role? Yeah, you know, um, you know, we were very lucky to have Tanner, and, and Tanner had um, he had played at, at obviously at Oklahoma, then he played the year before. And what Tanner had uh, over the other guys is he had a lot of experience of, of failure, in the sense of he had he had thrown the bad passes for those many years before to learn to not do other things, you know, not do it again, right? And so. What we have to do now is build those other guys up and give them those kind of experiences so that they can, um, you know, have the freedom to fail at practice and to learn from it, right? And, and where Tanner already had that built up. And so that's the that's the, the goal now is to try to build those reps with those guys so they learn what not to do, you know what I mean, and not to make the same mistakes over and over again. So, Yeah, Johnny Brewer there talking with the media after Tuesday's practice. And – a lot, of, a lot of good out of Johnny Brewer, too, but I did want to share that with you guys just in terms of how the coaching staff has to approach building the offense and, and expectations-wise going into this fall because, look, they start off with Louisiana Tech, a team that will be a tough out regardless of how they played last year. They have toughness. They, they always seem to be a tough out. We saw that when SMU went to Ruston last year or two years ago, I guess. That is a team that SMU will have to be locked in for, not be looking ahead a couple weeks down the road uh, when they go to Norman. So you have these early season games that SMU is going to be able to find out a lot about Preston Stone. He's going to be the starter. I don't think there's any you know, thought that he's not going to be. They're going to find out a lot as far as where he's going to be at going into conference play. He'll have opportunities to make mistakes. They're going to play OU. They're going to play TCU. Those are tough games. And he's doing that in practice as well. And for a guy that I thought the the last practice before spring break, he had his best practice, one of his best overall practices since he's been at SMU. Today, they had a little bit of a tougher go. The weather was an issue. Uh, the, the pass protection was poor. A lot of that factored in. And I'm not bringing this all up because of this practice. I'm bringing it up because we talked to Johnny Brewer after practice. And I think he makes a good point. There are things that he's going to have to learn as he goes through starting and being the starter game by game, the highs and the lows of everything. And he said it himself. That's what they're working with Preston on. He's, a, he's an emotional leader for this team. He is emotionally invested in SMU. So if something doesn't necessarily go the way he wants it to, he – feels that he feels that on his shoulders. So getting him to be a little bit more of a guy that lets the last play completely go is, is very key. I, I do think that's one thing Tanner Mordecai, and we can debate this for a whole nother podcast with some of you guys, but I, I do think he was very much forget about the last play. I think in last season, SMU was extraordinarily good at scoring after a turnover, whether it was Tanner Mordecai, whether it was a fumble, whether it was whatever, they were very good at responding. So, and, and their back part of the season showed that as a whole as well, going three and one in, in November, Tanner Mordecai, Tanner Mordecai led the way on that. This is a group that responds very well to Preston Stone, but Preston has to be the guy that this offense leans on to stir the drink because he is somebody that extends plays he takes some risks from time to time, but he can also run, pick up yardage. Uh, when he throws the ball down the field, he has the ability to make defenses maybe pull up a little bit because he runs as well and as often as he does. He showed that last year uh, in his limited playing time. So it's going to be a different offense. There's going to be highs and lows when you talk about having a first-year starting quarterback. We saw that with Tanner Mordecai. We saw that in the past as well with others. What do those those highs and lows look like? And how quickly do you move from the highs and the lows to mostly the highs and having that success that Preston Stone is used to having? So a very interesting topic came up today in that media, media availability. You can watch the whole video with Johnny Brewer on our YouTube page. Please subscribe. We are about 150 subscribers away from 1,000. We can't wait to hit that 1,000 subscriber mark. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Help us out. On that front, please. SMU's wide receiving group. I've been high on it. You lose Rasheed Rice, who's about to go through Pro Day on Wednesday. And you lose Austin Upshaw, an emotional leader. But you bring back Jordan Curley. And 
I've been high on Jordan Curley. We've talked a lot about his work ethic, about his playmaking, about, about how he's up 10 to 15 pounds in spring practice already because this is the first offseason he's had as a college player. But you might not have had that same excitement. Well, uh, one of the most excitable guys around SMU's campus is Rob Likens, the wide receivers coach. He's uh, pretty hilarious if you ever get a chance to go out to SMU football practice and watch him. But he met with us as well after practice. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel, he lit up about Jordan Curley. Um, you know, this is, like I said before, this was his first spring that he has been healthy and, and we're halfway through. But uh, but this is his first off season and he's been able to like work out, lift weights, his shoulders, you can see he's put on 10 pounds. Uh, he's starting to, at, at the beginning of camp, you could tell that extra weight was kind of bothering him a little bit, but I think now he's used to it and his, his, uh, his speed is still there with that weight. Um, so I think he's, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about his, uh, this year coming up for Jordan Curley. Did you catch that smile at the end of that one? <laughs> he is, uh, he's a fun guy to watch uh, day in, day out uh, in terms of practice. So uh, be sure to check out uh, Rob Likens' full interview on our YouTube channel. And we'll have more from him in a second on Jake Bailey. But Jordan Curley is, is just showing the type of guy he is overall. And he is leading this wide receiver room. He is setting the tone day in, day out. And he's doing it with his practice production. I think they're being relatively careful with him. They rotate a ton of wide receivers in practice. But they also have Keyshawn Smith and Romello Br Brinson coming in from Miami, who they're getting into the fold here, who are very familiar with the offense. And Rob Likens, excited about those guys as well. They bring something to the table in terms of speed and athleticism that really gives SMU some options across the board when it comes to wide receivers and wide receivers who can make plays down the field. But they also are missing Jake Bailey this spring, and it's allowed Roger Daniels to step up in a big way, and, and Rob Likens really praised him for that. And you don't necessarily see a ton out of Roger Daniels during practice because, as Rob Likens put it, he's a touch guy. We're going to create opportunities for him in games. Practice isn't necessarily – where we can just say, all right, it's time to get Roderick the ball. Let's get Roderick the ball. They're working on fundamentals. They're working on all the things that go into being a part of this offense just overall with Roderick Daniels. Jackson Lavender's been a nice surprise as a freshman enrollee. Um, Dylan Goffney continues to sit out and rehab coming off of his injury. Teddy Knox is obviously suspended. But Jake Bailey, when he comes back, he'll have to get back into the mix. But he was very productive when he did play for SMU this fall made a lot of plays, made some statements uh, at that slot position. And you can tell there's still excitement about him coming back. He wasn't out there at practice today until the end, coming back, you know, out there for the whole team meeting um, from his you know rehab session with the strength and conditioning staff. But uh, he's another one that Rob Likens is excited about. Yeah. You know, when, when a guy, you never want to like say a guy loses his job because he got injured, you know, in the coaching profession, you know, uh, but when he comes back, obviously, he's got to prove that he can be consistent, he can stay healthy, and all of those things. Uh, I, already, I already know the in, in intensity that he's going to have when he comes back. He's a tremendous leader. He's a veteran. So I'm not concerned. I kind of feel really good that I know where he's going to be. Mm -hmm. He'll get, have to get back into the swing of things. But I think it'll, it'll show itself when he comes back that he'll emerge and rise to the top. So they're excited about Jake Bailey. He would kind of complete, if you're you know, putting it together on paper, that wide receiving group and just kind of what they expect to be the starters as far as that group goes. Jordan Curley, Keyshawn Smith, Jake Bailey. I think that's the three guys, you know, if you factor in RJ Maryland and obviously them having a running back on the field, those are the guys you're expecting to step up and kind of be the starters at this point. Now, a lot of that is still to be worked out. Moochie Dixon has been one that has been flashing in a big way. Rob Likens also got excited about him. Overall, this wide receiving group is going to allow Preston Stone and Kevin Jennings, but mainly Preston Stone, to be comfortable, to be, uh, you know, that productive quarterback that we've seen at SMU, you know, over spanning many, you know, now many quarterbacks, really, for the most part of the, you know, let's say uh, early 2010s to now. That's what SMU's had. They've had fairly productive quarterbacks. They've 
done it in different ways. And there's been downfalls, of course, with the program here and there. But they've had good quarterback play or good enough. Preston Stone has the weapons to have really a nice, productive first season as a starter, something he's been waiting on for a long, long time. And I think one of the things that's going to help him the most, and we see it in practice, LJ Johnson had some great runs in practice today, especially during the team portion. Once the cameras were kind of turned off or, you know, we're, we're done filming, he ripped off a couple long runs. They have Velton Gardner coming back. Tyler Levine's working towards re, you know, rehabbing everything. Kamar Wheaton is suspended, but if he does come back, he's going to be a factor in there most likely just because of what he brings to the table. But Jalen Knighton with his ability to catch the ball and he, for a smaller guy, he can really pack a punch he loves being back in this SMU offense uh, and reuniting with Rhett Lashley. I paced, I paced um, how fast we go, keeping our defense on their toes. Uh, you got to have energy. You got to, like, plan against our offense. You have to come prepared. You can't just come out because we're coming so fast at you. And then we'll just run the ball at you. You can't stop it. So that's why I love this offense, the pace of it and the play calls we have. So SMU's offense, I mean, a lot of fun. Um, and you know, Jalen Knighton said it was pretty much a no brainer for him. You know, he entered the portal and he was going to hit up the SMU staff. That was kind of how it went for him. Same with, you know, Romel Rinson and, and Keyshawn Smith and a bunch of these Miami guys that are now here at SMU. They want to play for Rhett Lashley. So SMU's offense going to try to get back into the swing of things. Uh, maybe with a little bit weather, be better weather, uh, later this week, we'll be back at SMU practice, uh, on Thursday to watch. We'll also have coverage of, Pro Day on Wednesday. So be sure to subscribe to OnThePonyExpress.com. You can try it free for seven days. After that, it's 10 bucks a month. Or if you want to pay $100 for, for the year, it brings you down your monthly price. We had a bunch of people subscribe over the past couple of weeks. So appreciate you guys jumping on board. A lot of you are here because of Pac-12 expansion talk. We're going to get into some Pac-12 expansion talk. And once again, the league is, you know, uh, hitting center stage really for expansion what's next as far as the media rights deal and look it's late afternoon here in dallas as we're recording this and it's still mid-afternoon out there on the west coast but nothing is really broken from today's pac-12 um meetings with uh the board uh of, of directors of the pac-12 that's been kind of reported as a Maybe something to watch. You know, will a deal get struck? Will a media rights deal come to fruition? I still think things are um, trending in the right right way for SMU. It's just one of those things that takes time. It's frustrating. Um, I think people are fed up across the board with kind of what they're um, necessarily trying to get done and what's left to be done. We heard we heard Ross Dellinger on our podcast earlier this month. You just kind of see how it's dragging out and a lot of different things have to be done. But even once again, we've seen more Pac-12 athletic directors come out once again and, and you know, kind of go against um, the, uh, I guess, Big 12 kind of push that there is something wrong here um, with the Pac-12 and what's going to happen. Um, we've seen that over the weekend. Uh, another um, Pac-12 uh, school leader, coming out to kind of denounce that, you know, they're in trouble, um, that there's issues with the league and and kind of what's going on. Um, so, you know, look, there's a lot of people that are playing a game of poker right now, whether it be the media partners that are negotiating this, whether it's George Klyovkov representing the Pac-12, whether it's some of the Pac-12 schools, whether it's the Big 12 and them trying to poach some of these Pac-12 teams. This is still a situation for the Pac-12 that sits in a good spot. This is a league that has maintained a pretty united front when it comes to sticking together. They've done that publicly. They have not um, really done anything that you would expect in terms of turning on each other. We've not seen different messages start to come out of Pac-12 schools. Look, the, the closest thing we saw was really the Arizona president, President Robbins, saying we want to see what deal comes from George Klyovkov. And yeah, that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. So he's not completely shutting the door on, on things and, you know, trying to, you know, create a different um, 
you know, direction uh, for his school. He wants to see what his school is going to get out of these negotiations. So makes a lot of sense in terms of that. Um, but George Klyovkov is still in the midst of negotiating this thing. And there's really not too much new to report on this front. You know, we've continued to keep our ears to the ground. And look, there's a lot of people that, and I think this is one of those things that as you've monitored it throughout your time as an SMU fan, most likely if you're listening to this, but some others, where you've wanted a resolution for so long. And you've also seen people report different things. And we've seen this pop up here and there. I mean, even Dennis Dodd reported last week, I think it was that the Big 12 continues to have constant contact with four corner schools about expansion or something like that. Well, yeah, we've reported that SMU has been in contact with the Big 12 and ACC and Pac-12. And if SMU is doing that with, you know, a league like the ACC that doesn't necessarily seem like they're even in it with SMU and the Big 12 kind of the same way, of course, they're going to have conversations here and there across the board. That can look like a bunch of different things. So, look, I, I think when the dust settles, and this is me reading tea leaves here, but they, I think the Big 12 at its core is approved to expand. And what they need to expand is a media deal. And once that media deal falls into place, they're going to probably barring some last minute change, go after an SMU and go after a San Diego state for all the reasons why we've talked about. And as you kind of dive down into it, it's going to cost these schools more money to go to the big 12. If they get anywhere close to a pack to, uh, to a big 12 media rights deal for them to leave. So these schools have presented a united front which everybody talks about, well, they're having to sound off and this and that and kind of, you know, you can never believe anyone. Yes, but also at the same time, when you've watched expansion and realignment happen at other different points, you haven't seen presidents sound off on anything in terms of a united front. But these Pac-12 presidents, and now there's enough of them that I think you could say it's a good, strong contingent of them. They're all in this for the long run at least publicly. That's what they're saying. Privately, we'll find out if there's some sort of bombshell uh, to come from all of this. But the Pac-12 presidents are giving you the idea that they are united and they are waiting on a media rights deal. And that makes a ton of sense to me. I think a lot of people that are starting to track this have seen the buzz around the Big 12 kind of die down too. And you're seeing the Pac-12 really just sit in a waiting zone. It was something to do over the last really couple weeks of college basketball season was to present this Titanic like demise for the Pac-12 for some reporters and some people that followed it. That hasn't happened. Now the NCAA tournament's rolling and we haven't heard anything about it. So things continue to sit in a waiting zone for the Pac-12. It could happen while we're on this podcast recording. It hasn't yet. I've got a Pac-12 tab on TweetDeck open. But we also haven't seen any reason to truly believe what's out there in terms of this league falling apart. And I think the discipline that you look at with the Pac-12 and their message from a presidential standpoint is the biggest key to all of this. When trying to sit back and say, what's going to happen? And why should I sit there and think that this is going to happen, that the Pac-12 is going to expand, that they're going to invite SMU and San Diego State? It's the, the disciplined approach that this league has had in its messaging. So I think that's important for people to understand. I'm ready for it to end. I know people out there are ready for it to end. But this has been something where Sources, as much as they can say, continue to be optimistic. They continue to say that there has not been a formal decision yet. They know, and I know based on some conversations, that SMU has most certainly not been told no. And this is going to be something that comes together relatively quickly. 
whenever it happens, I'm of this belief, based on what I know with this expansion stuff going on, you're going to see a media rights deal and you're going to see invitations go out to SMU and San Diego State relatively quickly. That's because it's going to all going to be tied up together. There's a ton of debate that's going to go on as far as, well, when or what. We continue to just see it drag on. And I don't know why I don't have that answer. I, can t- I wish I did. But this continues to be something that presses on. There's not some change in 180 approach. And as long as presidents are still meeting over this and they're meeting together, this is something that there's, you see pressure on George Klyovkov to go ahead and get it done. But as long as it gets done, it doesn't matter. That said, the united approach with the Pac-12 presidents is the biggest key in all of this. You know, at least watching it from the outside, there's a very small group of people that really truly know what's going on. And sometimes when you see some of the rumor mill, that stuff that has been recycled from one thing weeks ago to the next, and you see things re-pop up, what you haven't seen is you haven't seen Pac-12 presidents recycle things. They're taking their own approaches at their own times to speak out in a united front. And that's about as good as it's going to get in terms of sourcing things and as much as people can say about it. Because the NDA for this, I can tell you it's pretty it's pretty tight. It's tight-knit. There's a lot of people that you would think are involved at SMU that aren't. And they'll be the first to tell me, you know, look, I've, I've been around it long enough that some people can say, can't talk to you about that. There's some people that say, man, I would love to know. Do you know anything? And I'm not saying that to say like people ask me what I hear. But I'm saying that this is a thing that goes to the very top, which involves the presidents. And it involves George Klyovkov. And it involves the media rights deal uh, partners. It's a very tight knit group. There's probably 90% of the athletic directors across the board, are really not looped into where things stand on this. We saw Rick Hart host George Klyovkov. He was a part of a large group that hosted him, put together a great visit. Things went well. If they didn't, we would have seen SMU be cast away in in all this by now, honestly. But they hosted him. They did a great job. But at the end of the day, it's it's not a large circle of people that know what's truly going on and that you can ask and say, all right, what's the deal here? Where does SMU stand? Where does this, where is that? What point of the process is this? There's just not many people out there. And right now the Pac-12 presidents hold all the cards and they're holding United front. that This thing is pressing on and they're waiting to see the result of what the media rights deal looks like that George Klyovkov presents. So we will continue to track it all at ontheponyexpress.com. Please Leave us a subscribe on the uh, YouTube channel as well as check out on theponyexpress.com. Lots of practice coverage um, and recruiting info on the site. So check that out. Appreciate all you guys who have already subscribed. If you're a subscriber to our website and you bring somebody onto the site, you get a free month for every person you bring on. So keep that in mind. Tell your friends about on theponyexpress.com. Thanks for all you guys who have subscribed already. We'll have another edition of the podcast wrapping up Pro Day and also taking a look at SMU basketball. What's next in the transfer portal? We'll talk a little bit about that um, on another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast later this week. We'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for listening and have a good one.